So the reason that I'm going to record this class is because I can then upload it to YouTube. And if I upload it to YouTube, then not only can you watch the course again, you can also uh, search the lecture. So let me show you what I mean. So this is a lecture that I recorded for another class uh, last semester. If you uh, go to the YouTube link and you click here, you can open the transcript. And if you open the transcript, not only can you read the course, you can also supposedly search the course. Why can't I search the course? Hang on. This is a thing that should work. OK, it's not working on this computer, but I guarantee you if you go home and try this, you can find uh, what you're looking for. This means that uh, if you want to rewatch just a specific part of one lecture, you don't have to go through the entire lecture. You can just search for where in the lecture you want to review. So I will be uh, doing this throughout the semester. I'll record every lecture and upload it to YouTube, and then I will post the link onto Moodle if you want to review. So my first question for all of you is, why are you here? This is the hardest course that I teach here at MCU. Why do you want to take this elective course. OK, hang on, something's wrong with my. Oh, it's working again. No, it's not. OK, let me let me reopen this. Technology. OK. And it is the hardest course I teach because nothing we will read this semester is in modern English. It is all in some older kind of English. So if you're not prepared to do all of the reading, uh, I strongly suggest you go take another course. I'm teaching uh, movies on Thursday. I welcome you there. Um, but if you're willing to put in the hard work and do, do these difficult early English readings, um, you're welcome to stay. So this is what we will be doing this semester. First week, introduction, that's today. Second week, holiday. There are too many holidays on Monday this semester. Weeks three to five, we will be reading a Renaissance English play called Tis Pity She's a Whore. I don't know if there is a Chinese translation. Um, now, you may have heard from your friends and classmates and upperclassmen that last semester we did not read this play. We read another play called The Tragical History of Dr. Faustus. Nobody liked that play, so I changed it. The problem, though, is that uh, Tis Pity She's a Whore, I took this from another book. It's not from a textbook. It, now, it's not in modern English, so there are 
footnotes. Uh, I will pass out the handout later. There are footnotes, but it's not the easiest uh, layout. It's not the easiest to read. So I, I'll pass this out later and I will guide you to show you how to read this play. Uh, the English Renaissance is basically Shakespeare, the time of Shakespeare. We're not reading a Shakespeare play, first of all, because Shakespeare is even harder. He likes to play with language, play with words. Um, so that makes it harder to read. The second reason is because uh, our department offers a Shakespeare class this semester. So if you're interested in Shakespeare, you can go take that class. Uh, in this class, this play, Tis Pity She's a Whore, is by John Ford, another English playwright. He was active a few years after Shakespeare. Shakespeare was around uh, 18, nine, sorry, 1590s to early 1600. Tis Pity She's a Whore was first performed in 1633. So it's a little bit later. Um, and I will introduce more about this play later today. Uh, as every classical English Renaissance play, it is divided into five acts. Ooh, but we only have three weeks. So uh, before next, next class, please read up to uh, act two, scene two. Before week four, please read up to the end of act three. And then by week five, you should finish the play. Uh, I chose these divisions to give you basically the same number of pages each week, more or less. So this is basically an equal division of five acts into three weeks. Uh, so when it says two, two, that means finish act two, scene two. You should read up to act two, scene three. And then week four, finish act three, and then week five, finish the play. Then the next thing we're going to read after another holiday, oh, I mean, there's a holiday in the middle. Week six, week eight, and week 10. Uh, we're going to be reading Paradise Lost, Silurian. This is the most famous epic poem in English. Now, unlike uh, Homer, right, the Iliad, the Odyssey, uh, Paradise Lost is not entirely about humans. In fact, humans are not the main point. Paradise Lost is the story of how uh, Satan corrupted Adam and Eve and condemned them to leave the Garden of Eden and wander the earth and work for food. So if you remember from, uh, did you guys read the Bible? No? Uh, from Genesis, one of the earliest stories is Adam and Eve were told not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So why did they eat this fruit? Paradise Lost tells us this story. Now, uh, like the Iliad and the Odyssey, it is in 24 books. We don't have time to read all 24 books. So uh, week six, before class, uh, please read the selections up to the end of book five. Before week eight, please read the selection from week uh, book six and the first half of book nine. And then before week 10, please read the rest of book nine, a little bit of book 10, and a little bit of book 12. Um, I tried to reduce the reading as much as possible, but at the end of the day, you still have to read about 500 lines each week. Not pages, lines. Um, each page has like 20 lines. So it's around 20 or 30 pages each week. And it's again, it's not in modern English. In fact, uh, because it's an epic poem, the author, John Milton, tried to use an epic style. And he thought that if he used a more classical, antique style, it would add to the effect of his poem, which means that it's even harder to read. Uh, again, I will guide you before we begin reading. I will give you some hints and suggestions. Um, 
to help you understand what you're reading. Do you have a question? Right, so uh, one of the main things you will notice when we start reading Paradise Lost is the sentence structure can be very weird. This is because Milton is copying the sentence structure of Latin, Latin In Latin, uh, actually the sentence structure is very free and open. You can rearrange most of the words and the meaning of the sentence will remain the same. But the best classical Latin style it uses the following structure. Subject, object, verb. Sometimes object, subject, verb. The verb comes at the end. Uh, so you may need to get used to picking out where does the subject end and where does the object begin. Uh, sometimes some of the harder sentences will feel like a puzzle. Like you can understand most of the words, but you're not sure the order that they go in. In fact, uh, I took Paradise Lost from a textbook and there are two or three sentences where even the editor says uh, the textbook is for like American students, right? They already speak English. The, even the editor will say uh, this sentence is confusing. The main verb is this. The main subject is that. Uh, so again, uh, I will help you practice this uh, before week six. Now, because we have so many holidays on Monday, we won't be able to take our midterm exam until week 10. Uh, it will be a take home exam. Which means that I will put it on Moodle. It will be essay questions. Uh, two questions and you can choose to answer one. You only have to answer one question. Uh, it will be open book. You can use any resource you want except for other people. You cannot ask other people, but you can use the textbook handout. You can use your notes. You can use the internet. You can go to the library if you're old fashioned um, and you can ask me. You can write me emails. Uh, I may answer, I may not answer. You can try. Um, but if you do use information that you find elsewhere, please give me the source of that information. If you don't give me the source and I can figure out where you found the information, that is called plagiarism, Taoshi. Uh, and that if I find that you have plagiarized even part of your answer, even the most unimportant part, you will get a zero on the exam. So it's a double sided sword, right? Double sided coin. On the one hand, you have many more resources. On the other hand, you have to be careful how you use those resources. Um, I'll go over this before the exam, but the late exam means that um, you will have one week, so the exam will begin after class on week 10. And it will end before class on week 11. I have to submit your midterm scores by 1 p.m. on Thursday of week 11. So if for some reason you forgot to take the exam or your computer crashed or something, please tell me immediately. There's not a lot of time to help fix the, these kinds of problems. Once I submit the midterm score, uh, I can't change it. OK, so please pay attention to the schedule. Now, uh, this also means that you will have to take your regular midterms for other classes uh, in between the unit for Paradise Lost. So I know some of you went before and or after you take uh, midterms. You may feel tired. Uh, you may not have motivation. You may not want to come to class. Uh, but if you miss week 10, you will be missing one third of that question. Right? That means that uh, you will be missing out on the ideas that we discuss on the content that I help you with for one third of one of the two questions. So that's like one sixth of the exam. Uh, so again, I encourage you to come to class on week 10. I encourage you to come to class every week, basically, but especially week 10. 
week 11 after uh, the midterms you will be recovering so i will show you a movie uh, this is the movie of the book we will be reading in the second half of the semester in the second half of the semester we're going to be reading the novel persuasion by jane austen uh, this was published in around 1830. It's closer to modern English, but there are still many words uh, that are used in a different meaning than we use them today. For example, the word want, I want something. At that time and before that time, the word want actually means lack, trifa. If you want to say I want something, you have to say desire, I desire something. Uh, so it's not exactly modern English, and this is when I suggest that you use an English to English dictionary. If you use an English to Chinese dictionary or you know Google Translate, it will give you one, maybe two definitions, uh, and it's probably not going to be the older definition. So if, when you look it up in Chinese, it may not make sense. Try to use an English to English dictionary. If you don't know which one to use, I have a very good suggestion. It's called dictionary.com. It's a very good English dictionary. Uh, so we will be reading the entire book, 24 chapters, uh, four chapters per week. Now, that sounds like a lot, but uh, when I give you the handout for this book, you will realize it's actually not. The first chapter is like three pages, right? So it's not that long. It, it gets a bit longer as you go, right? Not every chapter is as short as the first chapter, but it's never like more than 20 or 30 pages, maybe 35 each week. And it's also taken from a textbook. So some of the harder words and ideas, there will also be explanations for those. Uh, at the end of week 17, I will uh, give you the final exam. It will be in the same uh, process as the midterm exam. It will be on Moodle. Two essay questions, answer one of them. Both questions will be about the novel, uh, open book, open internet, all of that. And then week 18, you can do your other final exams. Questions? OK, so uh, how do I calculate your grade? Midterms are worth 40 points. Final exam is worth 40 points. And participation, which means come to class, is worth 20 points. Um, each week that you don't come and you do not take a leave of absence, so basically you skip class, right? Each week I will take away uh, four points out of 20. Is that right? Two, eight, no, no, two points, two points out of 20. Uh, and of course, if you miss uh, six weeks for no reason, you don't get a midterm score. All right, hope cold call. So this also means that if you decide to cheat on your midterm, and I catch you, I'm very good at catching cheating. You can ask your classmates uh, who have taken this course before. Uh, you will have to get a perfect score on your final exam to pass the course. Don't plagiarize, don't cheat. I do not like failing people. OK, so that's the grade. And again, like don't worry about the exams. If you have questions, you can always either go to the Internet or write me an email and I will be happy to help you as much as I can help you. There should be no reason for you to fail the course. If you take both exams, don't cheat and come to class. OK. OK, let's look at the Moodle page. So this is the Moodle. Uh, I designed the Moodle page to have all of the information that you may need for this course. Um, syllabus, oh, sorry, from the beginning, my email. Don't use, like if you click on my name on Moodle and you go to my profile, it will give you an email address. Don't use that one, use this one. 
the Moodle email address does not work. If you want to send me an email, send it to this place. My office, uh, if you want to come and chat or like beg for a higher grade, uh, but please email me first so I can prepare. Um, as I mentioned, I will be recording all of these lectures. Uh, so if you want to join by Microsoft Teams and you're not a part of the class yet, this is the team code. You can add yourself. Syllabus, we just talked about that. Class emails, if I send an email to the entire class, you can find a record here. Attendance, you can't see this. This is where I will record your attendance later. OK, first unit, tis pity she's a whore. Uh, the PDF, there are two PDF files. The first one is an introduction, and you don't have to read it if you don't want to. But if you want to learn more information about the play, uh, you can take a look. The second file is the play, is, is this. So like if you forget to bring it to class or you want to check something or whatever, you can find the entire thing on Moodle. Uh, and then you have uh, the PowerPoints for weeks three, four and five. These are all discussion questions each week. OK, ne uh, two weeks later, I will divide you into groups and then each week I will give each group a discussion question. Uh, and these questions are all open ended questions, which means there is no right answer and there is no wrong answer. It depends on how you understand what you are reading. Uh, and so uh, I'll go around. I'll give you some time to talk about the question and then I will go around, ask for what you think the answer is and we will talk about it. Uh, and by sharing different ideas about the same play, we can have a more comprehensive understanding of what is going on. Uh, so Three, four, and five are the questions for the readings for the play. Tis pity she's a whore. Next unit, again, introduction, and then uh, the poem, and then the questions. I suggest that you look at the Paradise Lost introduction. Uh, when John Milton first wrote this really long poem, his publisher told him, this is so long and complicated. Nobody will understand. Can you please add a summary of each book, of each chapter? And so for the second edition, Milton added a summary of each chapter. That's what I put in the introduction. So if you get lost, you're not quite sure what's going on, or if you want to have the whole story, not just what we're reading in class, you can take a look at that introduction. It is also written in older English, but it's easier to understand first because it's not part of the poem. It's a summary, so it's meant to give you information. It's not like to be beautiful and, and hard to understand. Uh, and secondly, because uh, Milton's publisher asked him to explain to people, so he's trying to be clear about what's going on. Uh, so I encourage you to look at the introduction to Paradise Lost. And then finally, uh, the novel Persuasion, also a short introduction, and the whole book is in the second PDF file. Uh, because the book is too long, I, I had to divide it into two paper handouts. I'll give you the first half and then later give you the second half. But the whole book is in one file on Moodle. And then you have the discussion questions. And then you have the exams, and I will explain about this in more detail uh before the midterm that's it okay so do you have questions about the moodle page okay great so uh okay then i can stop sharing this hang on technology where hang on OK, cool. So uh, let me pass out the play.
们做的会少的。Okay, let's take a look at this handout. So, um, I the beginning I marked with an X. You don't have to read that part. The play begins on the left-hand side called the scene. So this is where the action takes place. And it happens in a city called Parma. Then you have the list of characters and like who they are. Uh, in the classical tradition, it is divided into men and women. So uh, you may have to think about the relationship between the men and the women. Uh, and then at, you notice at the bottom of the page are the footnotes. The footnotes are directed to the line. Uh, so for example, at the left bottom of the page, it says two, nice, subtle. This means in line two, so on the right hand side, act one, enter Friar and Giovanni. The first line is the Friar says, dispute no more in this for no young man. The, and the second line, these are no school points, nice philosophy. So in the second line, the word nice means subtle. So the footnotes are a translation from uh, early modern English into contemporary English. So like most of the footnotes don't really explain, they directly translate. Uh, so like one way to read this is just go through the play and if there is a word or a phrase that you don't understand, check if there's an explanation at the bottom. So another example, on the bottom right hand side, uh, the third footnote, it says seven to eight. First dot 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 atheism. This means that from line seven to line eight, let's see, line seven is discovered first the nearest way to help. No, that's line six, five, six. No, yeah, that is line seven. Discovered first the nearest way to hell and filled the world with devilish atheism. So this footnote is explaining these two lines beginning from first. Ending at atheism. And the footnote explains that this means IE IE means in other words. Putting the pride of their argumentative skills before God and his laws they damn themselves from the start. So it's again translating these two lines. Uh, and you may also need to know to put A before B means to give A a higher priority and B a lower priority. Uh, sometimes the footnote will tell you that one word has more than one meaning. Sometimes it means that different editors disagree which meaning is best. Sometimes it means that this is a pun, Yu, and you should look at both meanings. So for example, on the right hand side, the first footnote, it says four admits, allows. This is simple, right? So line four, the word admits means allows. Semicolon, fen hao. Jest, one, exception, two, sophistry. This is telling you on the same line, line four, the word jest could mean either exception, li wai, or sophistry, gui bian. And uh, both meanings make sense in that line. Uh, so you can tell in the footnotes, a semicolon, fen hao, divides entries. 
before a semicolon is one word to explain. After a semicolon is another word to explain. So the first footnote on the right hand side for line four explains three words. Admits. Jest. And the third word is wits and wits means men of learning. OK, one last point on the left hand side, the first footnote, it says. One, one, one SD Friar. Right. This means act one. Scene one. Line one. SD means stage direction. Stage directions are any part of the play that is not a line. It's not something that somebody says. It's all the other parts like enter Friar and Giovanni exit. Or like, uh, you know, he laughs or he like he hits him. Things that describe actions. These are called stage directions. So this footnote tells us on the right hand side, act one. Uh, act one, scene one. Enter Friar and Giovanni. This footnote is talking about this line. Enter Friar and Giovanni. And the footnote says, starting the play with a religious figure, the Friar, he goes, Shou Shi, frames thought and action and anticipates the Cardinal's displacement of him at the play's end. So when you're trying to understand the, po the play, this footnote may not be very useful. But after you finish the play and you, re you understand what happens, and you come back and reread this footnote, it will make more sense. Uh, I just wanted you to understand what SD means. Now, each page is divided into two halves, but the footnotes on the left may refer to something on the right. The footnotes on the right may refer to something on the left. It basically just follows uh, chronological order. It's not strictly divided between left and right. So if you can't find something on the same side, you can look to the other side. OK, do you have questions about this? I said it's not going to be easy. Um, so if there's something you cannot understand, I always encourage you to look into uh, an English to English dictionary. Uh, some uh, basic rules you can keep in mind. Uh, in early modern English, the word thou means you, T H O U, right? Thou. Thy means yours. Uh, in modern English, we say, like, if it's a, uh, what was it? First person singular, then the verb ends in S, right? Uh, he does something, right? Ends in S. Or like he reads a play, ends in S. In early modern English, it ends in ST, uh, either ST or TH. So, for example, uh, let's see if I can find an example. Ah, okay, line 11. On the right hand side, line 11. Yet he thou talkst of is above the sun. The he is capital H, uh, so you know it's talking about God. Anytime you see he or him or his with a capital H, it's always God. So this line says, the God that you are talking about is higher than the sun. Right? He, thou, you, talkst means are talking, right? Uh, of here means about. Uh, line 17. Uh, all what I ever durst or think or know. The footnote tells you that what means that. And durst means dared to imagine. So this line means all that I ever dared to imagine or think or know. So as you read, you will start to get used to the logic of comparing the text and the footnotes and uh, seeing what you have to look up in a dictionary. Usually when I teach a literature course, I tell students if you don't understand something, it's fine. Keep going until you get stuck. You have to learn the language naturally. Uh, that's not true in this case. 
because all of these are older English. Uh, so especially for the play and Paradise Lost, if you don't understand something, go to a dictionary right away. For the novel Persuasion, sometimes you can figure it out, sometimes not. It depends. OK, so do you have questions about how to read the play? Uh, each act, the number of scenes in each act is not fixed. It depends on how many times they have to change places. Like maybe they go from one person's room to another person's room to a street in the city. It depends. There's no fixed number. OK, um, so now that we have a basic idea of how to read the play, let me tell you about the background of this play. Now, the reason that uh, literature people love Shakespeare so much is because not only is he a genius, his genius helped to uh, launch or further or you know advance what is known as the English Renaissance, Ingwo Wen Yi Fu Xing. So the, the, I, the, the presence of Shakespeare and his ingenious plays and his performances as an actor, all of that helped to spark the creativity of other playwrights and other creative people at that time. So whenever we talk about uh, Renaissance plays, we always have to start with Shakespeare. Before Shakespeare, there was a guy named Christopher Marlowe. Marlowe's main contribution to the English Renaissance is to give us the form of the lines. You will notice in this play that it's not written like a novel, it's written like poetry. Each line is a line of poetry. If you ignore the meaning of the lines and you listen simply for the rhythm, you'll see it's poetry. Dispute no more in this for no young man. These are no school points. Nice philosophy may tolerate unlikely arguments. But heaven admits no jest, wits that presumed on wit too much by striving how to prove its poetry. And this is the main invention that Marlowe gave us. Uh, he gave us a fixed line of uh, five feet and no rhyme at the end. So if you pay attention, most lines will sound like this. It's poetry. It's a fixed rhythm. Uh, technically, this is called iambic pentameter. I am, iambic means it goes da da, not da da, or da da da, or da da. Like it goes da da. That's an I am. Uh, unstressed, stressed. Qing ying zong ying, qing ying zong ying. And there are five of them. Penta means five. So there are five of these in each line. Um, and the reason this is such an important invention in literature is because if you listen to how somebody talks in English, most of the time it sounds like this. If you stop paying attention to what I'm saying and only listen for the rhythm, you will notice that most of the words I am saying kind of sort of fit into iambic pentameter. So if your poetry follows the rhythm of natural language, it sounds more natural. And if you use this poetry in a play, it makes these characters feel more real. At the same time, it still preserves the, the reason why it's written in poetry in the first place. And it is written in poetry to help the actors remember their lines. Plays in that day were kind of like TV shows today. They were the popular form of entertainment. If you didn't know what to do after dinner, you went to see a play. And this means that all of the actors were very, very, very busy. Some actors did a comedy after lunch and then a tragedy after dinner. It's impossible for anyone to remember everything in all the plays that they had to do at the same time. So actors used two strategies to overcome this problem. First, uh, they, they asked the playwright to write in poetry because poetry is easier to remember. The second strategy is actors would only remember their own lines. And the line before theirs 
and the line after theirs so that they knew when to go on stage and when to leave the stage. So in fact, the plays that we have today from that period are not uh, exactly as they were performed. These plays have been reconstructed from the notes of the different actors and if we can find it, the original copy by the playwright. Uh, but just like TV writers today, playwrights in those days were not very important people before Shakespeare. Usually people just paid them for a play and then took the play, divided it among the actors, made any changes they thought were necessary, and then performed it. And the playwright had no decision-making power about any of this. So the way that a playwright writes a play could be very different from the way it was actually performed. Uh, and that could be very different from like the each actor could remember things differently. And so the plays that we have today are not necessarily the plays that people of the time actually saw on stage. Editors try to uh, reconstruct as well as they can, but it's hard to get everything exactly correct. Uh, Shakespeare was important for this reason also. He was a playwright and an actor. So he wrote the plays, and then as an actor, he helped decide how to change the plays, how to divide the parts. And so we have so many of Shakespeare's plays, first of all, because they're damn good plays. People wanted to record them, but also because Shakespeare himself uh, tried to preserve and, and keep together his material so that uh, his own group of actors can continue performing them. Uh, now, in Shakespeare's time, plays were always performed outdoors. If you think about it, this makes sense. This was in 1590, 1600. There's no electricity. If you perform indoors, you need to have some kind of lighting in order for people to see what's going on. Usually that means some kind of fire. But it, you know, if you burn a lot of fire indoors, first of all, it's dangerous. Secondly, it sucks up all of the oxygen. It's and like people like faint. There's no air. So most uh, in Shakespeare's time, all of the plays were performed outdoors. But uh, near the end of Shakespeare's career, people started figuring out how to build indoor theaters. Uh, with enough light to see what's going on and enough air so that people like don't die. Uh, now, of course, the early indoor um, theaters were small compared to the outdoor theaters. And so you the, the first kind of audience to go to an indoor play would be uh, nobles, guizu, people who could afford the tickets, people who had the power and influence to get a seat. Um, and only slowly later did indoor theaters expand and improve enough to allow ordinary people also to be able to afford a ticket. By the time of John Ford in 1629, 1630, ordinary people could see an indoor play. So, Tis Pity She's a Whore was first performed indoors. This is uh, very uh, unusual for a Renaissance play. Now, whether a play is performed outdoors or indoors also has an influence on what happens in the play. If you're performing outdoors and you need to hide something, then you can't really, you, you have to like make sure nobody can see it. You can't really pretend like nobody can see it. It's, it's in broad daylight. Either you see it or you can't. But indoors, you can move the light around. You can add smoke and effects. You can build more uh, sophisticated stages because you had walls that you can depend on. Um, so in this play, there are some scenes where the action is more detailed, uh, where the character's position in space uh, has more meaning because it is performed indoors. Like it, on an outdoor stage, basically it's just two or three people uh, on a platform shouting out their lines to each other, maybe sometimes fighting. You can't really do too much with that. 
but in indoor theater, you can do so many more things. Now, this is, as I mentioned, a popular form of entertainment. So uh, today we think of these plays as high literature, but for people of that time, it was just like what they did for fun. And you had to make sure that people could understand what's going on. So aside from the lines, there was also a lot of physical acting. Today, when you think about acting, you may think like a good actor is someone who is subtle and careful, and you can tell the many different uh, emotions that the actor is performing for you. In those days, the best actors were big and loud and very obvious actors because it was a form of popular entertainment. People in the very back row had to be exactly clear about what was going on. And uh, just like today, the most popular form of movies are Marvel movies, uh, specifically action movies. So back in those days, the most popular form of plays had a lot of physical action, fighting, murder, conspiracy, all of these great things. Uh, this is one of those plays. I'm going to spoil the ending for you. Out of all of these characters, only like three people are alive at the end of the play. And part of the fun of this play is watching how they die. Uh, especially near the end of the play, like one of the last deaths is really, really disgusting. Uh, so that's something to look forward to. Uh, so like before next class, please read up to what did I say it was two two. Let's see, where is that page? Oh, I marked it. It's on page. 683. Did I mark it? No, 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 that's not. Why did I mark that part? This is very strange. Uh, no, 2-2 two, two is on page. Ah, it ends on page 687. On page 687, the lower left hand side, it says 2-3. So read up to that part. Questions? Okay, let's take a short break. Uh, yeah, Chenda, okay, that you mentioned. Uh, okay, let's come back. Uh, OK, so as I mentioned, in two weeks time, I will divide you into groups uh, so that we can better discuss each week's questions. Today, I want to give you a general idea of what this play is talking about to sort of help you uh, as you read in the next two weeks. At the center of this play is a brother and a sister, Giovanni and Annabella. Giovanni has been studying in a faraway place for many years, and he has finally finished studying and come home. And he meets his sister, and they fall in love. Uh, and of course, this causes many problems. Uh, one problem is that as a young woman of marriageable age, Annabella is supposed to marry uh, someone who is obviously not her brother. So on the one hand, she's in love with her brother. On the other hand, her father wants to, like, her to marry some other person. Uh, so that's one problem that she faces, that they face. Another problem is that Giovanni went to study theology, sanxue. And uh, as I'm sure you know, lust, yuwang, is not a good thing in Christian theology. So falling in love with his sister is also a danger for his future career as a teacher, as a scholar, as a man of learning, as a religious person. 
So this is the main problem of this play. But in English Renaissance plays, there are always subplots, fu xin, right? Some minor characters also have uh, some problems. So in this play, uh, the minor characters are related to the man who wants to marry Annabella. This dude is named Soranzo. He's a nobleman, Guizhu. He's rich. He has a good position. Annabella's father wants her to marry him. She, of course, is in love with her brother, so she tries to delay him as long as possible. But while Soranzo is pursuing her, it turns out he also has some enemies. And his enemies also have enemies. Uh, and so it becomes very quickly, it becomes a complicated four way conspiracy about who is trying to kill whom. Uh, and so the play very skillfully brings us first to this story, then to that story, and it introduces each new character and why they want to kill somebody else. Um, but as the play grows more and more complicated, as more and more people start to do, uh, I guess, evil things, uh, you always have to remember at the center of the play is this romantic love story between two people who really should not fall in love. Uh, that might be one of the questions on the final exam. Midterm exam, midterm. Um, so that's the basic story. Uh, let's look at the characters. OK, so the scene, Parma, the actor's names. Bonaventura, a friar. A friar is a religious man, so in Chinese, I guess we could call him like Shou Si or Sen Lu. Uh, because friar is also a title, so in the play, we don't really see his name. We only see his title, friar, or, you know, F-R-I. This is uh, Giovanni's teacher. The next one, a cardinal. What is cardinal in Chinese? Uh, the, in the Catholic Church, the guys who wear the red hats, Zhujiao, yes, um, Da Zhujiao, right. So these are the highest uh, people in the Catholic Church right under the Pope, right, Zhao Zhong. First the Pope, and then the Cardinals, and then the Archbishops, and then the Bishops, and then the Priests, and then the, the clergy. So a Cardinal is a very important person in the Church. And it says here that he is Nuncio to the Pope. Uh, a Nuncio is someone who speaks for uh, you can notice the relation to the English word announce. So basically, whatever the cardinal says has the same power as if it was the pope who said it. Very powerful guy. He's the most powerful person in the play. Next, we have Soranzo, the pursuer of Annabella. Then we have Florio, a citizen of Parma. So he's just some dude. Uh, in this play, Florio is the father of Giovanni and Annabella. Then you have Donato, who is another citizen. He's not as important. Grimaldi, a Roman gentleman. So, like, uh, the play is written in 1630, but it takes place sometime in the past when the Roman Empire still existed. So by calling Grimaldi a Roman gentleman, it means that he is he's not a noble, right? But he's more important than all of these other random people. Uh, the power of a Roman citizen is uh, if uh, he is wronged or like, you know, someone offends him, a crime is committed on him, uh, he can go and ask the Roman government for help. Whereas most people who are not citizens of Rome cannot do so. So he's considered more important than uh, the other regular people. Next you have Giovanni. He's the son to Florio. He's the main guy of our play. Uh, the name Giovanni has now become a rather symbolic name uh, in literature, in European literature. 
because Mozart wrote an opera called Don Giovanni about a guy who, uh, because of love, uh, gets killed in a in a duel or something. Uh, and it's a very famous play. So like today, when we see the name Giovanni, we immediately think of these connections. Love of someone he shouldn't love and like the danger of death because of that love. Next, we have Berghetto and Richardetto. Uh, the Etto endings tell you that these people are not only regular people, but they're like not very high placed regular people. Uh, Berghetto is the nephew of Donato, and Richardetto is a supposed physician. Physician means doctor. Supposed means uh, people think he's a doctor. And that should tell you uh, that maybe he's not a doctor. And there's a reason why he's pretending to be one. Then you have Vasquez, servant to Saranzo. The name Vasquez is Spanish, so he's not Italian. Poggio, servant to Berghetto. Uh, in this play, Berghetto and Poggio are the jokers. They're the comic relief. Uh, in the English Renaissance, Shakespeare was the first person to do this, but in a tragedy, he would add uh, two or three uh, comic characters so that in between the really heavy dramatic parts, the audience could have a chance to laugh and relax and then be thrown right back into the action. So in this play, uh, Berghetto and Poggio are the comic relief. They're there to lighten the mood a little bit to provide a contrast. Fanta. If the entire play is just like murder after murder after murder, you, you start to get tired of it. But if in the middle you have like some funny scenes and then you have some love scenes and then you have a murder, it feels more powerful. So those are the main uh, male characters. After that, you have like what we would call extras, pa long tao. Banditi, which means bandits, tu fei. And then officers, attendants, various people who run around on stage. The women, there are fewer women in this play. Um, you have, first of all, Annabella, daughter to Florio, lover of Giovanni. Then you have Hippolyta, wife to Richardetto. She also becomes famous, uh, sorry, more important later. Then you have Philotus, Richard Detto's niece. Uh, the name Philotus is also a very interesting name. Uh, Phil, that beginning means love. So Philotus is like, uh, I guess you could say like the name means like little love or something. Like, uh, you know, some some uh, women today might have a nickname like Xiao Ai or something. And then at the top of the right hand side, you have uh, Putana, tutress to Annabella. A tutress is a woman tutor. A tutor today, we in Chinese, we call this jia jiao, but that's not what it used to mean. A tutor or tutress is uh, someone who not only teaches, but also like takes care of uh, and it's not just about learning like math or English. It's also about learning how to be a good person, morals, um, ceremony, etiquette, these kinds of things. Uh, so, so Putana is not only Annabella's teacher, she also helps take care of her. So you can think of her more like a Naima or something like that. The name Putana is also very interesting. Uh, Putana sounds a lot like the word for uh, a rude word for vagina. So you can tell that she's not meant to be a serious character. Like you, whatever she says may not be the most correct thing. And then uh, the extras include various ladies who help out whenever uh, a scene requires more people. So those are the main characters. Uh, throughout the play, if you get confused about who is who, uh, you can always look back to this list to help you remember. And as you read, 
I encourage you to take notes while you are reading. Uh, the exams are open book, which means you can use your handouts and you can use your notes. So the better notes that you take, the more information you will have for the exam. So for example, after each uh, long speech, you can write uh, a summary of what this character is talking about. Or after each scene, you can write a summary of the important things that happen in this scene. That way, when you want to look up some information during the exam, it will be faster. Uh, and writing these summaries will also help you remember what happens. Okay, do you have questions about the characters? Okay, um, so for the rest of today, let me guide you through the opening, I guess, one or two pages of the play to help you get a start. Act one, scene one, enter Friar and Giovanni. So at the beginning, nobody's on stage, and then once the play starts, these two walk out. Uh, usually, I guess they would walk out from the middle of the stage, right? The stage is a platform. Behind the platform, there is like a, a kind of building with two or sometimes three stories. Uh, and in the middle of each story, uh, each floor would be a door, a double, a set of double doors. So usually uh, when it says at the beginning, enter somebody, somebody, usually they would come in through the middle. Enter Friar and Giovanni. So Giovanni and his teacher, the friar, dispute no more in this. And the footnote tells you dispute means argue. And this word is used especially for rhetoric and logic. So uh, we can think of this as like, uh, dispute no more in this. For, for means because. No, young man. These are no school points. So the points that you're talking about are not just some argument for school, right? Uh, these you're making serious. Uh, you're putting for serious ideas. These ideas matter. Nice philosophy, it says nice means subtle. Uh, so like the like nice philosophy means like um, carefully separating concepts carefully making differences and distinctions to get at the precise meaning of what you want to say. And here his teacher says, this kind of philosophy may tolerate unlikely arguments, but heaven admits no jest. So like if you want to make these careful, sophisticated, like these kinds of arguments, maybe logically they make sense, but in terms of religion and heaven, uh, heaven can tell when you're joking and when you're serious. Uh, this kind of careful logic doesn't work in uh, for the purposes of your ultimate getting into heaven or not. Wits, and the footnote tells us wits means uh, men of learning. So scholarly learned people. Wits that presumed on wit too much by striving how to prove there was no God with foolish grounds of art discovered first the nearest way to hell. I'm just going to translate this for you. Uh, people full of learning who depended on their learning in order to prove that God does not exist using foolish arguments, those people entered hell first. Not only did they go to hell, the next line says, and filled the world with devilish atheism. Atheism is, of course, Wu San Lun. So these people who tried to prove God does not exist, not only did they go to hell, their ideas remained on earth and continued to spread through the world with evil. Such questions, youth, are fond. Fond means foolish. So these questions, young man, that you're asking are foolish questions. For better tis, tis means it is. So the, the play, tis pity she's a whore. It is a pity that she is a whore. Whore means genius, but it also means like a loose woman, woman who does not care about who she has sex with. 
the title is not entirely sincere. The title is a little ironic, and you will tell by the end of the play. So uh, your questions are foolish, for it is better to bless the sun than reason why it shines. So like, don't ask too much, right? If you have the sun, it's shining. Uh, be thankful. Don't ask too many questions. Yet he thou talkst of is above the sun. The God that you're talking about is even higher than the sun. No more. I may not hear it. So I, I may not hear means I am not allowed to. As a religious person, I am not allowed to hear these atheist arguments that you're talking about. So from the very first speech, we know that Giovanni is someone who is learned, scholarly. He knows a lot, but for some reason he's trying to argue something that is not very religious. And his teacher is telling him to stop before he gets into religious danger. But of course, if Giovanni stopped there, we wouldn't have a play. So Giovanni, gentle father. Notice how these two words are put at the end of the line. These, this is the same line, even though it on the page it moves to a new line. But if you combine the end of the friar speech with the beginning of Giovanni's response, that makes up one line of poetry. So when you're counting lines, this is the same line. Gentle father, which means priest. To you, I have unclasped my burdened soul. I have opened up my soul to you. I have told you my secret. Empty the storehouse of my thoughts and heart. A storehouse is like a storage room, a warehouse. So he's saying, I have told you everything. Made myself poor of secrets. If you're poor of something, that means you don't have it. So poor of secrets, he's given uh, the friar his secrets. Have not left another word untold, which hath not spoke all what I ever durst or think or know. Uh, hath means has. So I no longer have any word that I have not told you. Um, I have told you everything that I dare to imagine or think or know or learn. I've told you everything. And yet, is here the comfort I shall have? Is this the only comfort you can give me? Must I not do what all men else may love? Uh, every other man can love. Why can't I? Why am I not allowed to love? And the friar says, yes, you may love, fair son. Giovanni. Must I not praise that beauty, which if framed anew, the gods would make a god of it, they had it there, and kneel to it as I do kneel to them? So this line is saying, the woman I love is so beautiful. Can I? Should I not praise her? Can I not praise her? Uh, and the way that he describes her beauty is, she's so beautiful that if the gods uh, framed anew, Uh, if the gods saw her as if for the first time, they would make her a god and kneel to her because she is so beautiful. Uh, and like, notice, he, this is a Christian world, but he's saying the gods, like there's more than one god. Uh, and this is because in the Renaissance, even though it was still a Christian society, uh, more and more people were learning about ancient Greece and Rome. And so often in the culture, they would talk about gods, more than one god, uh, even though they don't really believe in those gods. Uh, so he's saying like, she's so beautiful, why can't I praise her? In other words, why can't I love her? And his teacher says, why foolish madman? He's saying like, you're an idiot and you're crazy. Giovanni, shall a peevish sound 
a customary form from man to man of brother and of sister be a bar twixt my perpetual happiness and me. So in modern English, this is. Should this small sound, this conventional name between men of brother and of sister, should these names prevent me come between my eternal happiness and myself? So in other words, uh, I love her so much. Why should the simple fact that we are brother and sister prevent me from loving her? They're just titles. They're just names. Brother, sister, doesn't mean anything. Uh, twixt means betwixt, means between. So this is when the audience learns uh, why they are arguing. Not just be because Giovanni loves a woman, but because Giovanni loves his sister. Say that we had one father, say one womb. Uh, say here means for the sake of argument. Let's say that I agree. We had one father, say one womb. Womb is the gong, so we came from the same uh, womb. And then on line uh, 29, he adds, curse to my joys. It's like this thing is something that causes him unhappiness. Say that we had one father, say one womb gave both us life and birth. Are we not therefore each to other bound so much the more by nature, by the links of blood and of reason? So this is one of those foolish arguments that his teacher is warning him against. His argument is, we are born from the same mother, therefore we already have the strongest possible connection. Uh, continuing. Nay, which means no. If you will have it, which means if you will accept my argument. Even of religion, so our coming from the same mother, our connection is not just the strongest in nature and the strongest uh, logically, it's also the strongest in religion. To be ever one, ever means always. One soul, one flesh, which means body, one love, one heart, one all. So you can tell that he's, you know, slightly going crazy here. Uh, just because we're born of the same mother, we're the closest and basically we, we could be like one person. That's how much we should be allowed to love each other. And of course, his teacher does not accept that at all. He says, have done, which means shut up. Uh, done means finished, right? So have done means like finish what, what you're saying. Stop talking. Have done, unhappy youth, for thou art lost. You are lost. Uh, in Chinese, you might think this means mi si, but that's not what it means. It means you are damned to hell. Your soul is lost. Uh, so he's saying, like, if this is what you really think, there, then there's no way you're going to, like, go to heaven. Giovanni says, Shall then, for that I am her brother born, my joys be ever banished from her bed? Then means therefore, right? So therefore, does it, for simply for the reason that I am her brother, does this mean that I can never enjoy her bed? Which means like, can I never have sex with her? No, father, in your eyes, I see the change of pity and compassion. So here he says, no, I look into your eyes and I can tell you're starting to have pity on me. This is an, a good example of how in a Renaissance play, things have to be very obvious. Like for someone sitting in the back row, they can't see the actor's eyes. So the, the other actor has to tell everybody, I can see the change in your eyes. I can see the change of pity and compassion from your age as from a sacred oracle, Shenzhi, distills the life of counsel. So you're an older guy, you're like an oracle. Uh, you must have good advice. Counsel means advice. Tell me, holy man, what cure shall give me ease in these extremes? 
in my extreme condition, in my situation, uh, what cure can you give me to help me? Uh, and he doesn't say like to to cure my situation. It says to give me ease, to make me feel better. And uh, the friar gives the only answer he could possibly give. Repentance, son. Repentance means fan hui, chan hui. Repentance, son, and sorrow for this sin. For thou hast moved a majesty above with thy unranged, almost blasphemy. So again, the word majesty is in capital M, which means it's probably referring to God or Jesus or like to a saint, some important religious uh, figure. And so his teacher is saying, uh, repent. It's still, uh, it's not too late for you because now that you have asked for my help, uh, God will be willing to help you. That's what it means. Thou hast moved the majesty above. Uh, sorry. Uh, here, moved means angers. So you have uh, the the crazy arguments you have been making. You have angered God or one of the higher powers, and so now you must repent. It's now or never. Uh, line forty-five. Unranged means crazy. Blasphemy means uh, what? What is this in Chinese? Like when you when you offend a god. Uh, so he's saying that what you're saying is almost blasphemy. Um, actual blasphemy blasphemy would be denying that God exists, but this is very close, right? He's denying that there is a difference between uh, brother and sister and man and wife. Marriage is one of the uh, seven sacraments. Uh, it's a holy event. So if you're saying that uh, you should be able to marry your sister, you are blaspheming the idea of marriage, which is very close to blaspheming uh, the idea of God. So he calls this almost blasphemy. Giovanni, oh, do not speak of that, dear confessor. Confessor is a priest because in the Catholic religion, a priest can take your confession, right? You can confess to a priest, gaojie. So someone who takes confession is a confessor. And Giovanni here, this is interesting, right? The Just a few lines ago, he's saying, uh, I'm as close to my sister as any two people can be. We must be able to love each other. And then uh, the friar says, you're going to go to hell if you keep on saying this. And immediately Giovanni says, oh, don't tell me that. It scares me. So you can tell that even for someone who is madly in love as Giovanni, he still has that religious belief. It's still a Christian society. And then in the next long speech, uh, the friar realizes that Giovanni is starting to see why he's wrong. And so he continues trying to convince him to change his mind. In Chinese, we would call this Chen Shen Zhui Ji. Art thou, my son, that miracle of wit? Art thou means are you. Art means are, thou means you. Uh, are you, my boy, that miracle of learning, who once within these three months wert esteemed a wonder of thine age throughout uh, Bononia? Could this be the same man who everyone thought was a genius in these past three months? How did the university applaud thy government, behavior, learning, speech, sweetness, and all that could make up a man. Think back to how your university praised uh, all of your uh, merits, all of your good points. Government means how you carry yourself, how you govern yourself. So it's a kind of morality. Behavior, learning, speech, sweetness means 
temperament, pishing. A sweet temperament, so a kind and good, uh, easy to get along with. I was proud of my tutelage. Tutelage means teaching. So he's saying, I was proud to be your teacher and chose rather to leave my books than part with thee. So when you left the university, I chose to leave with you. To leave my books, then part with the part means to leave. So he chose Giovanni over his own learning. I did so, but the fruits of all my hopes are lost in thee as thou art in thyself. So he's saying, yes, I chose to go with you, but the result of all of my hopes, fruit means result, jiegu, of all of my hopes are lost in you right now. Like the person who's saying these crazy things, you have lost all of my hopes. Just as you have lost your own soul. So by damning yourself, you are also wasting my hope in you. Oh, Giovanni, hast thou left the schools of knowledge to converse with lust and death? H hast thou, have you? Have you left school and knowledge only to begin to talk about lust and death here means the death of the soul, again, going to hell. Is this what you left school to do? For death waits on thy lust. Waits here means depends. Death depends on your lust. Your lust will cause your eternal death. Look through the world and thou shalt see a thousand faces shine more glorious than this idol thou adorest. So basically he's saying there are so many other beautiful women in the world. Why must you love your own sister? In line 61, he calls her an idol. Idol uh, originally meant sanxiang. And in the Ten Commandments, Shijie, God ordered uh, his followers not to worship any idols other than his, uh, or and any other idols. So here the friar is comparing Giovanni's love of Annabella to worshiping another god. This is a very serious claim. Leave her and take thy choice. So he's saying, you know, leave your sister, pick any other woman. Tis much less sin, though in such games as those they lose that win. So this is very interesting. He is a religious man, but he's saying to Giovanni, go and sleep with any other woman. And even though that's also bad, it's not as bad as sleeping with your sister. Uh, that's what the last line means. Though in such games as those, they lose that win. They lose that win. The better you are at sleeping with women, the more you lose your own soul. So even though this is the case, it's still better than loving your own sister. Giovanni, it were more ease to stop the ocean from floats and ebbs than to dissuade my vows. It would be easier to stop the ocean tide, zang cao tui cao, than it would be to make me give up my sister. Friar, then I have done. I have nothing more to say. And in thy willful flame already see thy ruin. Flame, fire, is a symbol for lust. So, so in willful means uh, stubborn, like not willing to listen to good advice. Uh, so in your stubborn lust already I see your ruin. Heaven is just, it's an eater. Yet hear my counsel. So like when you see this performed on stage, you can imagine, right? He, at first he says, OK, I have nothing more to say to you. But then he turns around and says, one more piece of advice. Listen to me. Giovanni, because uh, the friar is his teacher, always very respectful. As a voice of life, I will listen to you as if you were life itself talking to me. 
friar. Hi to thy father's house. Hi means rush, run, go. Go to your father's house. There lock thee fast alone within thy chamber. Lock yourself solidly. Fast means like fixedly, solidly. Lock yourself solidly alone within your room. Chamber means room. Then fall down on both thy knees and grovel on the ground. Grovel means aicho. Cry to thy heart. Wash every word thou utterest. Utter means say. In tears. And if it be possible of blood. Beg heaven to cleanse the leprosy of lust that rots thy soul. So basically his advice is go home and pray with all of your might and energy and will. Pray to heaven to save you. Acknowledge what thou art, a wretch, a worm, a nothing. So of course, compared to the power of God, everybody is nothing. So he's saying, uh, don't be so prideful in your own logic, your own importance. Admit to God that you are nothing compared to him. Weep, sigh, pray three times a day and three times every night. For seven days space do this. Then if thou findst no change in thy desires, return to me. So do this for one week and if you still love your sister, then we'll, we'll talk. I'll think on remedy. I'll think of some way to cure you. Pray for thyself at home whilst I pray for thee here. So you go pray for yourself there. I'll pray for you here. Away. Away is a command. It means go away. Leave. Away. My blessing with thee. We have need to pray. Giovanni. All this I'll do to free me from the rod of vengeance. Else I'll swear my fate's my God. So he says he will do what the friar asked him to do in order to save his soul. The rod of vengeance is basically a symbol of how God punishes those who deserve to be punished. So he, to avoid God's punishment, he'll, he'll pray like this for a week. Or else, I'll swear my fate's my God. Uh, if after doing this, he can't save himself, then he, he, that means that he will have to admit that his real God is not God. It's his own fate. Because if even God can't change his mind, then he's not really God, right? And then the stage direction on the right, exeunt. Exeunt means exit everybody. Everybody leaves the stage. So Act 1, Scene 1 gives us the basic problem of this play. Giovanni loves his sister and it's not allowed in Christianity or like anywhere to love your own sister romantically. So his teacher is trying to convince him it's a bad idea. You're going to go to hell for this. And Giovanni is like, but I love her. She's so beautiful. And so they agree that he should go home and pray to God to help save him. And of course, I'm sure you can guess it doesn't work. Again, if it worked, we wouldn't have a play. Act one, scene two uh, is a different part of the story. Enter Grimaldi and Vasquez ready to fight. So after an argument, now we get a fight. Very exciting play. Um, I'll leave it to you to uh, to you guys to find out what happens in act one, scene two. Do you have questions uh, about Act 1, Scene 1? Okay, uh, I will be here if you have questions. Otherwise, see you in two weeks.